Prince Edward Island, located in the southern part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, is by far the smallest of the Canadian provinces. The island is only 200 kilometers long by roughly 30 kilometers wide. Yet its coastline, which measures 1,260 kilometers, is vital to the island economy. During the summer, these shores are among the most intensely used in Atlantic Canada because of the warmer inshore waters and extensive sand beaches. Selected beaches provide the only local source of aggregate for the island construction industry. Many of the estuaries are prime aquaculture sites and biological nesting habitats and small fishing harbors dot the entire coastline. Ship traffic to and from the island is not extremely heavy. Nevertheless, in the event of a marine oil spill, the impact on the island economy could be severe. Low altitude oblique aerial video of the Prince Edward Island coastline was completed in two stages. Initially, the Northumberland Strait shore from Sea Cow Head to Hillsborough Bay, including the Charlottetown Harbor area, was videotaped on November 10, 1988. The remainder of the island was completed two years later on October 12 to 13, 1990. A total of eight hours of aerial video using three-quarter inch videotapes was shot from a Canadian Coast Guard helicopter. Flying height was generally kept between 100 and 150 meters at a distance of about a half a kilometer from shore, except where coastal fog and rain forced the helicopter to reduce its altitude. The flying speed generally varied between 60 and 90 knots. Videotaping coincided with low tide stage whenever possible in order to document the maximum extent of the intertidal zone. Interpretive commentary provided on the videotapes highlights the physical character of the coast, the anthropogenic activities in the coastal zone, and some biological observations made during the flights. The field commentary has been edited in places to clarify geographic locations and to add further information about a particular stretch of coast. The coastline of Prince Edward Island is low-lying with elevations exceeding 20 meters in only a few areas. The general configuration of the shoreline is dominated by the underlying geologic structure, while a detailed coastal morphology is a product of dynamic forces such as winds, waves, tides, currents, and sea ice. Where the coastline parallels the geologic structure, such as along the west and northeast part of the island, the shoreline is straight. In contrast, where the geologic structure is perpendicular to the coast, such as along eastern PEI, Erosion along the fold axes has produced a very indented coast. Similarly, the large bays such as Melpac Bay have resulted from erosion along the broad northeast-southwest structural axes. The coastal zone is composed of either sediment or soft recessive bedrock, which means the rates of shoreline change are rapid. Erosion rates are commonly half a meter to a meter per year, according to an air photo study in 1988 by the PEI government. Owens, in an earlier study, provides a detailed description of the coastline. He divided Prince Edward Island into eight coastal environments on the basis of processes, geomorphology, and resultant shore zone sediment transport systems. The northeastern coast consists of mainly low rocky cliffs with only a few pockets of sand beach and a moderate sized barrier beach across the front of North Lake. In contrast, the remainder of the north coast is characterized by extensive sandy barrier beaches with large coastal dunes fronting several broad embayments. Between the embayments are cliff shores which attain heights of 30 meters at Orby Head. The famous PEI National Park includes a large portion of this coastal environment. Although the tidal range is only about a meter, Higher wave energy conditions and an abundant sediment supply have produced dramatic shoreline changes, particularly at the tidal inlets which cut through these barrier beaches. Low bluffs, mixed sediment beaches, marshes, and extensive peat deposits are found along the inner shores of Malpec and Cascumpec bays. The west coast constitutes a third coastal environment. It is reworked by high energy waves which transport sediment primarily in a southward direction. The coast is predominantly rock cliffs of 5 to 10 meters relief with barrier beaches fronting only a few small estuaries. Closer to West Point, 
Wider sand beaches with larger dunes occur as a result of increased sediment input from the north. Egmont Bay is characterized by low unconsolidated shores with extensive marshes and mudflats at the head of the bay. Submerged sandy shoals exist along much of the outer bay and several low degraded barrier beaches are found along the western shore. Along Northumberland Strait, rocky shores form the outer coast and unconsolidated mixed sediment beaches fringe the inner parts of the bay such as Bedeck Bay. Large barrier beach systems such as those on the north coast are absent because of the smaller wave regime and scarcity of sediment. Farther to the east, the coastline consists of a very pronounced crenulate pattern of rocky headlands and coves with extensive intertidal flats. These flats are covered by distinctive low parallel sandy bed forms. Coastal Environment 6, Hillsborough Bay, has a complex shoreline with both low mixed sediment beaches and rocky cliff shores. Marshes fringe the upper part of many of the small river estuaries. The Hillsborough River is the largest of the estuaries and it's the largest of three drowned river valleys which coalesce at Charlottetown Harbor. The southeast coast of PEI is characterized by bedrock and unconsolidated cliffs up to 25 meters relief. Large sandy beach complexes are few, with the largest occurring at Wood Island. The east coast is very picturesque with broad shallow estuaries, partially enclosed by barrier beaches and separated by bold headlands. Just south of East Point, several spectacular barrier beaches occur and some of the largest wooded dunes on PEI are found here. Cape 5, the northern coast of Prince Edward Island. Our video coverage starts at Tignish Run and follows northward to North Point, then along the most spectacular cliff shores and the small barrier beaches like at Nail Pond, the fishing villages like at Miminagash, and then we follow southward into lower shores into the spectacular coastal lowland at West Point and Cedar Dunes Provincial Park. Then along Egmont Bay we come across Indian Point Barrier Beach Complex which shows some major changes since the 1960s. And we cross through Bray Harbor, along Egmont Bay, to the entrance to Percival Bay, where our coverage ends. A fringing, wide fringing sand beach, uh, dune grass at the back, or marim grass. And here's the harbor, it's very well constrained uh, at the Tignish Shore, it's actually called Tignish Run. And you can see some riprap at the back of the uh, beach. And the marsh you see here is uh, part of the uh, Tignish River Estuary. You can see uh, access road along the back of the barrier. Hours. Uh, we're getting to a bit of uh, rain showers here as they get up to the uh, north point. Along here, the, sh uh, the shore scarp is uh, bedrock controlled. A uh, bit of vegetation on the top. It looks like some sand is getting up on top of the ridge because you got some dune grass. But I would say it's probably less than four meters in height. dark stuff in the ba bottom of the uh, beach might be uh, peat, but it, I suspect it's probably bedrock with vegetation on it. So we're getting into much more of a bedrock shore now. Uh, sort of a very uh, narrow, fringing sand beach. Uh, probably some bed forms that we can't see. It's a bit more wavy here, and it's uh, turbid, so we can't make out the extent of the sand deposits offshore. But uh, given that bedrock's uh, close to the surface here, it's probably not that thick. The back shore here is a vegetated uh, either field or uh, over top of bedrock. Could be some uh, thin glacial deposits over top of the bedrock. But as, you, as you can see, at that promontory, the bedrock does go almost right up to the surface.
some uh, a look at the uh, channels that are developing. Probably somebody's made them as uh, areas to get down to the beach, but they uh, look like the waves have been running up them in the last little while. They're forming shoots, but I suspect they're just for areas for getting down to the beach. Is Sea Cow Pond, a small harbor at that village, Walken Strain Harbor. That'd be slide uh, 23 pond. Quite interesting seeing these uh, shoots. Uh, I suspect the waves could funnel up those pretty good. Bedrock control, there's it's probably the bedrock will swing around maybe perpendicular to shore here. Very much uh, more sort of a foliated uh, weathering and a wave cut platform. The uh, beach itself is sort of mixed sand and gravel, uh, gravel at the top of the beach. You've got quite an accretionary feature uh, extending off North Point. At North Cape or North Point, there's a large uh, gravel shoal coming offshore, probably bedrock controlled. You can see the shoreline is primarily a low erosional cliff, uh, anywhere from about four to eight meters high, looking back towards Tignish. There's a better view of the gravel shoal at the end of the Cape. You see the shallow near shore in the, at the uh, west side of the Cape. Probably about a four to six meter high bedrock shore. That's the experimental wind station. Um, I believe it's the National Research Council uh, where they're studying the uh, wind power. Here you've got a very sheer uh, rock, uh, bedrock uh, shore. I would guess it's probably getting up uh, close to 12, 15 meters uh, with a very cobbly, uh, bouldery uh, base. high tide unfortunately but I think offshore you'd see maybe a bit more sand but uh, essentially this is a much coarser shore a very uh, straight shore done like the other side of P Prince Edward Island. You get some caving along here but the bedrock is aligned such that you're not even getting uh, wave cut platforms. There's some stacks that are showing up and uh, just up a little way. It's amazing that there's not very much debris along this shore. It's I think the erosion rate's about 0.3 to 1.7 meters per er, uh, feet per year, so it's not very large. So that may be why there's no debris at the base. like a glacial material over top of the bedrock but in places but it's not very thick. That sort of change in color at the top of the cliff you can see uh, might be unconsolidated but I would rather imagine the bedrock extends right to the surface of these cliffs, I would guess they're probably, uh, no contour here, but I would guess they're probably uh, 10 meters, 10 to 15 meters at least. Here you're getting some rock falls and some uh, uh, more uh, accretion at the base. But again, it's still a very uh, narrow, uh, heterogeneous gravel boulder uh, sand. Uh, 
bridge each door. See the farmland extending right to the edge of the cliff. Which suggests that there is some uh, fair amount, of, you know, maybe a meter of uh, uncontrolled material. In this valley, there seems to be more glacial material or uh, unconsolidated material. And as you get to Nail Pond, uh, we're getting a barrier developed across and marsh uh, in behind. Uh, very low barrier. Dune uh, development is uh, marginal. Uh, there's dune grass, but uh, they're less than a couple meter high dune. No dune ridges. There used to be a lot of uh, wave overwash, and you can see it. Uh, difference in the vegetation that shows up the washover channel. A site survey was also completed at Neo Pond uh, for the Canadian uh, Coastal Sediment Study, uh, but this site was not chosen for the sediment transport experiment. Number 29 and 30 of Neo Pond. Here there's a higher dune, uh, probably up maybe three, uh, three meters, four meters at most. It's got an erosional uh, four dune scarp at the top, some blowout development, probably more where people have been interfering with it. And on the foreshore you've got uh, some cuspate, uh, cuspate, and there appears to be an offshore bar. Certainly in places there is, it's uh, hard to see it though. There you can see uh, one of the berm ridge and rental developments. Some older dunes in the back. By these cottages, there's a, a higher bluff. It may be the source of sediment for that barrier. It appears to be unconsolidated sediment. So it appears that it's being fed by sediment from the uh, southwest. Uh, back into the cliff uh, shore. Uh, there seems to be possibly a difference in the bedrock, just about the wave limit. It could be that it's just wet, but it's a lower bluff. Maybe uh, just under 10 meters. And you can see the unconsolidated sediment uh, sticking on top of it. It's a good couple meters to three meters uh, thick. This is probably the source of uh, that barrier for sure, uh, further north. It's also maybe feeding these beaches that we're coming into now is much wider fringing beach. Some bedrock exposed in the lower tidal. Offshore, uh, it's uh, hard to see it, but it's uh, mainly uh, sand uh, with some intermittent uh, bedrock and uh, coarse substrate. Back shore here, I've got uh, dune, uh, minor dune development all along this shore. Photo 32, the scale of the marks made by a truck. Some fairly large uh, dune blowouts and uh, isolated dunes. It could be as high as uh, five meters. Where people have cut through them, they're quite obvious. You can see them, we just went by some. I suspect it's Skinner Pond we're just coming up on now. You can see the harbor. this uh, section there's uh, quite an extensive barrier with uh, some linear dunes and uh, fairly well established vegetation in behind marsh and behind that in Skinner Pond. As you go further south you're getting into unconsolidated uh, erosional uh, bluff probably about uh, three four meters high. Flying at about 400 feet and at about uh, 70 to 80 knots. The 
are getting more into bedrock now. Uh, this uh, cliff, I guess maybe 10, uh, 10 to 15 meters, uh, there's no contour, but I would guess uh, may be higher than that, maybe as high as 20. You can see Highway 14 in the background as we're going along the coast and we're near the village of Waterford. Here you've got some unconsolidated sediment over top of the bedrock. Some goline in it. The lower inner tidal has got more uh, bedrock exposure. And so it's a probably just a sand veneer over top. A much different sort of uh, structure. It's very thick. Uh, well, it looks like I just all these sediments over top of bedrock, uh, but uh, you can see bedrock uh, ridging up high in the cliff. So it must be just the way it's eroding. Looks like the inconsolidated material is probably only a meter, two meters thick at most. Let's have a look back at that uh, section of coast. There's a good view of it there. Just getting a view looking southward uh, from uh, Horsehead towards Black Pond, a pleasant view. Uh, still a low uh, rock cliff uh, shore with a shell, uh, with a narrow fringing sand, maybe gravel beach, some gravel anyway. Looks like there's a few access points down to the beach. Um, seems to be more gravel right at water level and at the back of the scarp, back by the scarp. Just coming up on Black Pond. Uh, and here you have a bit more uh, sand deposits and dune uh, marim grass and so on. Uh, variable width to the sand beach, uh, certainly quite wide here at the outlet. And as you go by uh, the Black Pond uh, outlet, you're getting into more of an unconsolidated uh, scarp. Maybe one to three meters. Beach is maybe 50 to 100 meters wide. And again, you've got a bit of a mixture of sand and gravel. Um, several access points to the beach from uh, Pleasant View. Offshore you can see some extensive sand deposits and uh, even further offshore you can see some uh, bedrock exposures, uh, some stream outlets, um, and occasionally you'll see some depositional beach features like uh, a welded bar or a cusp uh, feature. But it's pretty consistently uh, fringing sand gravel beach with a uh, little scarf in the back shore. As we approach uh, Cape Gage, uh, uh, you get a bit more um, sand in the back shore and older dunes. Very low ones though.
me up on Mimin Nagash. And um, it's October uh, 12th at uh, 1700 hours, and we're flying at about uh, 500, 450 feet. And uh, we've been keeping around 70, 80 knots. We're just coming up on the settlement now and the uh, extensive wharf and brake wall development. There you can see a good shot of the uh, excess, ex extra riprap they put on the uh, north side of the, of the uh, harbor entrance. Probably one of those will have to keep dredged. To the south of there, uh, in front of the pond, there's uh, some old uh, dune development, probably in uh, marsh and behind that. Probably fed by these unconsolidated cliffs uh, for the south. They're probably three or four meters high. And in the um, mid-tide zone, there's uh, extensive gravel. Uh, the upper tidal zone seems to be mixed sand and gravel, but primarily sand. Here you're getting more into bedrock again. But there is unconsolidated sediment on the top. You can see that break in the, the color uh, just along the top. It seems to be the edge of the bedrock. There's a gully somebody's made for an access uh, to the beach. Is that quite uh, uh, Good fringing uh, sand beach along uh, this stretch. Very even uh, shoreline, uh, very little uh, convolutions and uh, embayments. And those embayments that were there have been infilled by any sediment that was coming along shore. As I was saying before, the erosion rate here is about uh, 0.4 to 1.2 feet uh, per year, according to their photo analysis. Here you can see the bedrock a little more clearly in these cliffs. I don't know what the actual rate is here, but there's very little uh, accumulation of sediment at the base of the cliff, so it's being swept clean by that the erosion rate is not very high. Access to the beach along here would have to be from either end in the low-lying areas where there's uh, a road. Here we've got a mixed sand and gravel beach. Uh, just looking at uh, little Miminagash uh, Pond and the uh, barrier that's been developed in front of it, you can see the outlet is uh, cut down uh, through the barrier and some dune uh, development and uh, runs along the side of a cliff shore. Cliffs are probably two or three meters high and uh, as the cliff increases in height to almost 20 meters further south, the shore gets, uh, the sand beach gets narrower and narrower. There's uh, more uh, coarse material involved. See the cliffs along here are quite uh, steep. Uh, they run around uh, 20 to 30 meters in elevation. Very, uh, very strong uh, gulling uh, along the edge of the cliff. It's somewhat different uh, weathering, uh, and there's more uh, debris, talus debris, at the base of these cliffs. Beach, mixed sand and gravel at uh, high tide, uh, just below high tide. Yeah, there's uh, much more gully in here. I think it's because it's a uh, thicker deposit of unconsolidated material on top. It's primarily a sand beach, but there's certainly a uh, gravel uh, storm ridge at the base of a lot of the cliff. And this gulling is slumping towards the top uh, along this section. And in the lower intertidal, you can see patches of uh, coarser substrate uh, just below the sand. There, these appear to be more unconsolidated cliffs. 
certainly a lot more uh, unconsolidated uh, slope uh, deposits over top of it. But here you can see where it's been cleaned away. There is bedrock uh, quite high up, at least two thirds of the way up the cliff. You just gain a view of Campbellton and the Campbellton Provincial Park. giving us some good lighting on the uh, cliffs. You can see a lot of rock falls along here. There you can see a much better idea of the uh, must be a good uh, three meters of unconsolidated uh, material, probably glacial, over top of the permocarboniferous uh, sandstone. We get some rock stacks that we just saw back there, and there appears to be a sandbar about a couple hundred meters offshore. And in 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 that, uh, there, there's a coarser, uh, probably a bedrock uh, platform, or at least a coarse substrate. But it's a fairly uh, wide beach. Uh, we're uh, on a falling tide right now, but we're up near high tide. There's a Cape Island there for scale as we go by. I wonder how he's going to launch that one. Here you get some uh, quite spectacular uh, cliff development along here with some gullying in places. Access to the beach would be difficult in a lot of this area. The mixed sand gravel and the boulder riprap at the base of the cliff. Much more accumulation than there was elsewhere. You're getting up closer to 30 meter uh, cliffs along this area. by a section where you can see a well-defined wave cut platform uh, about three or four meters above sea level. There it shows up again. I don't know if that's an old uh, sea level indicator or not. And there's a wave cut bench with the uh, glacial material on top. It's quite pronounced all along here, this uh, wave cut bench. I'm not sure the title stage, but I guess that it's a uh, storm uh, wave cut bench. It's probably a function of the uh, bedding in this particular section. Much more slumpy than the uh, groundwater uh, sea beach and uh, galene on the top of the rock bench. Must be a much finer material overlying uh, the rock uh, bench. Just going by uh, Seal Point and coming up on Howard's Cove, a fairly, fairly substantial uh, harbor development here with riprap. And again, we go back into a cliff uh, around 8 to 15 meters high. Very shallow near shore, but looks things. That's the wave cut platform here. Down along the coast, you get a much wider fringing uh, sand beach. There is some gravel uh, storm ridge development in the small valleys, and a little bit of dune uh, development in the, the wider valleys where the streams are coming out and the sand is thicker. Here you can see some uh, upper slope erosion. Uh, not quite sure whether it's uh, wave spray or whatever, but. Looks like somebody's probably cleared the land. Again, you're getting finger uh, promontories coming out of the bedrock and uh, in intermittent pocket sand beaches underneath the wave cut uh, bedrock. The 
south of Cape Wolf where uh, we're coming in to see more of the village of Cape Wolf and uh, a wider fringing beach with unconsolidated sediments behind. In the near shore it looks like an uh, intermittent sand uh, veneer over top of a coarse substrate. There's quite a bit of uh, kelp. Uh, if they come up into here again, you're getting a different erosion. Uh, much thick. Well, the bedrock's going pretty close to the surface, but you're getting slope deposits on these fingers uh, as they protrude offshore. Height, I'd guess, at about uh, 10, 10 meters anywhere, 10 to Maybe as much as 20 meters is coming up here. The uh, 30 meter contour is just back of the coast, so it's probably close to 20 meters here. Much more rock fall, talus debris along the base. Very little uh, fringing beach. Offshore, you can see bedrock exposed. Cows for scale. Um, it looks to be uh, maybe one, two meters, uh, maybe as much as three meters when consolidate over bedrock. Uh, again, uh, access to the uh, very uh, narrow beach or through the chutes or uh, drainage channel. You can see coloration where the water table comes out on the cliff about a third of the way down. Just having to reduce our elevation due to the fog bank uh, We're down around 100. As you can see, we're uh, just about at uh, cliff uh, height, so they're probably around uh, 15 to 18 meters high. Variable, though. You can see uh, some wave erosional uh, caves and caverns undercutting. It's around 10, 15 hours, October 13th, and we're just around Cary Point, north of uh, West Point. Uh, it's a bit foggy, so we're having to stay a little low. As you can see, the cliffs here are around um, permacarboniferous uh, sandstone, quite recessive and uh, quite sheer as well. They're running up to uh, pretty close to uh, 18 meters high. Highly variable, though, and you can see the unconsolidated sediment is. Uh, one to four meters thick, variable along the shore. Oftentimes at the promontory, the bedrock's coming right up to the surface. See the tractor in there for scale, thank you very much. Bit of a waterfall and a creek coming out. Sand beach with uh, sort of a rock uh, erosion debris at the base. Mixed sand and gravel on the lower inner tidal and some Dune development at the back. There's a small uh, four dune ridge here, probably about uh, two, three meters high. Just coming up on the uh, West Point area. And uh, it's all along here, you get this sort of older dune uh, in the back shore.
not very wide, probably only uh, a couple uh, hundred meters uh, of old dunes to some blowouts and uh, older vegetation. Seems to be some old vegetated marsh in behind that. As you get closer to West Point, the uh, light that's coming up, uh, the dune development is much greater. Goes a uh, farther distance inland. We're just coming up at the edge of Cedar Dunes Provincial Park, which is just north of West Point. See the trees uh, on West uh, Point appear to be on maybe old ridges or dune ridges are lined up in uh, nice linear pattern here. Uh, I wouldn't doubt if there's old beach ridges and dune ridges in the back. And as you get to the end, there's uh, quite an accretion area uh, uh, form. This area is supposed to be receiving a, about plus 17 feet a year is accreting and just a little bit further uh, to the um, east, there's erosion. Seems to be building up at the end of the Cape. You can just see the well-developed beach ridges in this coastal foreland. And because of the excess sediment here, you can see an aggregate removal program at the far end of the uh, beach plain. And it uh, may well be that the harbor and the wharf structure has uh, trapped a lot of that sediment. what they've done is they've gone looking for the spots where there's a lot of sediment and they've designated certain beaches where they can mine. This is one of them. been circling West Point. This is an area where they can mine because of the excess sediment. As you can see the uh, front end loaders down below, it says it looks like a mixed uh, coarse sand. Uh, or if you get on the other side of the West Point Harbor, we're starting to get into an area of erosion where you got peat. Here it's estimated between 1935 and uh, 58, there's about five feet per year of erosion, and it's uh, roughly nine feet per year, I think, uh, more recently been estimated. They've got quite a, a contrast along this shore. Here you can see uh, some of the old marsh deposits and the sand beaches built up across uh, this outlet. Along here, as we go along the peak, you'll see some uh, submerged uh, tree trunks in places. As we move along this shore, we're going out of the sort of the peat marsh area into a barrier complex, which in 1839 was a single ridge. On the whole, it's uh, broken up into three parts now, and uh, it's been moving landward uh, ever since uh, that time. Uh, there's a paper by Forward uh, in 1958 that documents the aerial uh, differences along this shore between um, 1935 when the 
1958 when the air photos were taken. There you can see the marsh in behind the uh, barrier. Very narrow dune uh, ridge, very low, probably less than two meters above mean sea level. Then there's a, a closed off outlet at this end of the beach. shot of the uh, barrier uh, uh, fronting Wolf Inlet. As I say, it used to be situated a little bit further seaward, and as you look down, it's uh, quite a turbid water, it's quite shallow. Uh, the beach itself is, uh, looks like coarse sand, uh, very little dune development because it's quite a bit of overwash by the looks of things, and there looks to be overwash uh, infilling at uh, the back. Looking down at some of the ridges, there's uh, gravel as well on uh, the coarser areas. Sort of a fine gravel on top of the beach. Coming up on the recurves at the end of uh, the spit. You can see there's uh, some uh, older established vegetation, but no trees yet. It's still uh, pretty well marim grass. Uh, a mafla for the most part, some beach pea. Sort of a mixed sand and gravel. You can see a bit more gravel in the high tide ridge. The spit platform just coming up here in the uh, ebb tide delta, flood tide delta deposits. swinging around the end of the uh, first barrier at the inlet. It's moved in quite close to shore now, uh, and the uh, flood tidal deposits, uh, or the ebb shield, it's hard to tell at this point which is which, uh, are almost uh, merged right on shore. In the back shore here, just before we join the next barrier, which is almost attached to the shore, you've got a sort of a low scarp, uh, You see an old sand deposit a couple hundred meters offshore, but there looks to be maybe bedrock controlled scarf. This uh, ridge has been moving constantly landward since the 1800s, and you can see there's a couple roads now attached to it. part is uh, dune, uh, established by dune grass. It's a little bit higher, but on the uh, flanks, it's uh, been infilled by overwash deposits. And again, it's sort of uh, fine gravel and coarse sand. Coming up to the uh, end of the flank of this barrier, you can now see why there's a road going out to this barrier. They're mining the end of it. Looks like there may have even been a road of some sort coming out at the one end of the barrier as well. The slides up to number 17 at the end of the spit. You can get a good idea of what the material is like in the barrier by uh, looking at what they've been digging up. It's quite a bit of uh, fine gravel and coarse sand. The 
has him fishing in behind the barrier. We're just circling around looking at the end of the barrier and we'll carry on. That what they've been doing is dragging the sediment off the spit platform just at a low tide, uh, dragging it up. So instead of the uh, spit uh, prograding around the corner, it's actually being uh, mined at where the sediment's coming in there. On the inner shore, uh, our um, Got a low scarp, less than two meters, vegetated, a uh, bit of dune grass, sort of vegetated mat, sort of sand gravel beach. Intertidal, lower intertidal is more sandy. And going, looking up that inlet, uh, go up to uh, Beaton Road, uh, you can see there's quite a bit of uh, marsh vegetation and vegetated area. What's interesting is the barrier that used to be here is gone now. The geese are all sitting on it, but it's uh, it's submerged. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's uh, happened here, but I, I don't see it anywhere at uh, Bray Harbor. Looks like there's a couple of worms here and groins, but I don't uh, can't make it at all. Sort of looking from Bray Harbor out outward. Certainly, the uh, the old barrier that uh, was supposed to be eroding at uh, one uh, to four feet per year seems to have uh, left the shoreline, or certainly been overwashed and uh, submerged because there's certainly a sand barrier out out offshore. Moving further along from Bray Harbor, we've got a vegetated mat at the high tide, uh, a bit of dune grass and uh, mixed sand gravel uh, along the back shore, primarily a sand, the uh, shore fringing beach. Offshore, you've got more sand deposits over, uh, well, it's vegetated, it's hard to know what else is there. Shoreline elevations increasing to around 8 to 10 meter uh, cliffs. Uh, you can see there's considerable more gravel in the beach and there's some rock outcrops at the base of the cliff. I can see an access road along the back shore and um, a fairly narrow uh, fringing beach. Uh, the pilot informs me about uh, half a kilometer offshore there's a bar it extends along shore. Is there one or two? It looks like there are almost maybe two. Yeah, maybe the waves are breaking on two spots. Maybe, and there may be a more one of one in here. We're picking up a few uh, bars uh, and probably ridge and runnel type of uh, topography offshore. It's uh, unfortunately high tide so we can't see them very well. But as we come up on Percival River, we're getting into a more shallow environment uh, and another barrier. As you can see here, there's a considerable marsh uh, development in the back, uh, as well as a narrow dune ridge. Some old recurves that have been vegetated, uh, old beach ridges. Offshore, there's uh, several uh, ridge and runnel uh, sand uh, bar features. At least uh, five or six of them. They look fairly uh, low 
and we're traveling now around uh, 400 feet. Uh, 23, 24 of the barrier uh, fronting uh, Percival River. It's called Baptiste Point, uh, the end of the barrier.